So this talk is all about tests. More specifically, tests for code examples in documentation. Um, when I was at the presentation, when I was at the conference and did a quick straw poll online and asked people whether they have automated testing for code examples in documentation, I think about five, 10 percent of the people raised their hands. So that was quite interesting. So hopefully it was interesting uh, and new to you as well. So at Weaviate, we started to add these tests to our code examples just a few months ago. And what I wanted to do was share the experience with you, what that's been like, why I think tests are great, and why I think adding automated tests is the logical next step for documentation as code. A little bit about me. Um, my title is Technical Curriculum Coordinator, Developer at Weaviate. Uh, but I like to describe myself just as an educator. Uh, it's a shorter title and it probably makes a little bit more sense. So I work on our documentation, our educational materials, uh, run workshops and so on. Let's talk a little bit about tests though. You probably know what automated tests are, but in case you don't, uh, I've got a friend to talk about it. So basically automated tests uh, tell us whether a piece of code is working or not. It's relatively standard in software, but I don't think it's quite as standard in documentation. And obviously I've given away the lead with the title. I think tests are great, but here are a couple of things that I want to convince the audience of. One is that automated tests on documentation will lead to developer success. Probably kind of self-evident, but I think it goes a little bit further. This might look a little bit familiar. So a user says, hey, this example or this piece of code, whatever, isn't working. Or you might have seen that yourself when you're trying to learn something. And this is a really frustrating situation. And as a writer or an educator, it can be even more frustrating when you can't really tell when you go and investigate and you can't uh, immediately tell whether a piece of code is working or not. And that'll add unnecessary overhead to your work. So this is really not where you want to be. This might be uh, the exact opposite of one of the other talks that we had at the conference, which was about the being the first to dopamine. And so one of the things, the other thing that I want to convince you of is that automated tests on documentation will not only lead to developer success, but also your own success. So the talk isn't just about tests. Um, it's all the, about all the things that we've done around tests, right? So, because you might be uh, writing the code examples or tests. So you might not be writing the code examples or tests, but hopefully I can do a good job of demonstrating why tests can be useful. So this is what uh, the code examples have done for us. I think tests have really given us extra confidence in our code examples. It's actually simplified our workflow, which might be a little bit surprising, given that we're adding something else. And we actually, when we started, had some questions about how much overhead might it be, uh, how will it affect our efficiency in writing documentation and so on. I would argue that in the short term, it's been pretty comparable. And in the medium to longer term, for sure, I think it'll save time. It's also changed how we think about modularizing code and how we reuse code, which has been also really interesting. And overall, I think it's really changed how we think about code snippets and what code snippets really uh, are in our documentation. And from the user's perspective, the code used to be presented a little bit like this. Now it looks like this. And if you're thinking they're the same picture, you'd be exactly right. So not everything has changed there. Uh, before we get into all of that, I'll just give you a little bit of background of what we do at WVA and why this is important for us. So we're a startup and we build Weaviate, which is an open source vector database. We have two APIs, GraphQL for queries and REST for uh, CRUD operations, basically. We build WCS, which is our SaaS service. And also we uh, produce a number of client libraries and there are actually um, some community built client libraries as well. So a typical code snippet in our, on our website looks like this. So we'll have Python examples as the majority of our users are Python users, but we'll also have a lot of JavaScript and TypeScript um, as the builders on the web obviously use these. Weaviate's written in Go, so we'll have examples in Go. Uh, some of our users use Java, so we have Java examples. We have curl examples as well for GraphQL and for REST, and also we have some pure GraphQL examples. So it's it's quite a lot of different languages, six or seven to uh, to, to in total. And 
In terms of code snippets, uh, writing code snippets, we'll write them in its own markdown file so they can be reused in another file like this. They would get componentized and included in another file in amongst the pros. And to the user, it gets presented something like this. So the markdown on the left gets simplified into tabbed presentations. And from a writing perspective, this is a typical workflow. So we would either write our own examples or get the code example from engineers, um, make sure that it works, uh, trim it to snippet, and paste into documentation. Here's the thing about documentation, though. Adding code snippets is relatively easy, um, depends on the length of it. But when you come back, maybe a month or even a couple of months later, how much do you remember? And this is what makes maintaining and editing your code examples tricky. So you might consider which server did I test this code example against? What data set did I use? So when I say article, did I mean Wikipedia articles or did I mean news articles? What was the data? When you look at the response, is it actually correct? And actually, quite often, you might not even know what the response should be. And you can document all of this in comments, but then how confident would you really be that they're right up to date? So as, some, as I would say, it's uncertainty kind of all the way down if you just document in static uh, text or comments. And here's a real example that I found from, uh, I think, maybe a month or two ago. So this code example is broken. And extra points for you if you uh, noticed what was wrong with it. But actually, it's missing this comma here. And it happened because this line was added later when we added uh, the replication features to the database. And I think what's happened was that uh, we had to edit a bunch of these examples. So people went around and added these code, um, this line at the end. And I think some uh, examples had a trailing comma and some didn't. And, and this one just got fell through the cracks. And you can imagine why, because if you just look at it, it's very hard to tell whether it's got that extra comma in place or not. And sometimes errors aren't even visible, right? So this is a GraphQL query. And the thing about this code was this code ran just fine, except it was it was producing the wrong answer. So one of our community users a little while ago was asking about this. And it took a little while um, to figure out what was going on. And the problem we identified later was that it was running against an outdated version of the server and the data set. So even though the query was perfectly fine, uh, it was behaving unexpectedly. And we just couldn't figure that out until we decided to look at the server. So looking at code and trying to figure out whether it works or not is, is a little bit like this. It's a lot of mental gymnastics, and it's just not really necessary. So the maintaining code examples for us means maintaining these examples in six or seven different languages, in database uh, configs that are configurations that are numerous, with multiple data sets, and keeping up with all these changes that happen at a startup pace. And as you can imagine, being a startup, we iterate very fast. There's a lot of new features and new releases. And if you've watched a bunch of infomercials, you can probably sense what I'm going to say next, which is that there has to be a better way. So the impetus for this was that we one day received a message. And it was entitled, Testable Documentation from our colleague, Jeremy. This is what he said. He said, code examples are the first encounter with WeV8 that many clients or developers will have. And it's quite difficult to keep documentation up to date. And documentation contains an extra comma or a missing quotation marks. You can see he was quite prescient about the extra comma or a missing comma. And he says, without testing, there is no way to ensure that our documentation is up to date with our code base. At WeV8, we love tests. More tests are always better tests, Jeremy. So this, for me, was very much of a eureka moment. And the thing is, our documentation is already open source. So we host it on GitHub. We take advantage of all the benefits of Git and GitHub, right? So version control, CI, CD. And we use the Docusaurus framework, which is a React-based library. So we can uh, have these components, as you saw earlier. So why not treat it as a real code base and add tests? The question then was, how do we actually implement this? So this was our first attempt at um, implementing tests. We started with our code examples and existing snippets like these. 
and then built tests around it. So that involved connecting to a database and parsing the code, the extracting the code examples from the documentation. Uh, we had to amend the script to do things like, you know, import libraries that are needed, connect um, to the instance, and then run tests. Uh, so run the code and check the outputs against the expected outputs in states, i.e. run the tests. And then you'd have to, of course, spin the, da uh, spin the database down and delete any data if you, you're using a permanent database and so on. Um, and this worked well enough. Um, it was We picked up quite a few errors, and obviously the tests are able to be automated because it was all scripted. But there were some challenges. Um, the main one was that there was really only very limited information at the snippet because the snippet's obviously very short, and all the associated information to automate these tests was somewhere else. So it was a lot of cognitive work for the writer, and there was just a lot of disconnect between the two sides. So we went back to the drawing board a little bit. And what we decided was that what if code examples like these were just code? And what we mean by that is that instead of having these snippets of text like this, which is what Markdown is, and extracting the code from the text, what if we just wrote all of the code that we needed to make it self-contained, right? So as it turns out, this solves a lot of the challenges that we talked about previously. For one, it means that we're able to simply run the whole script as is to perform the test without running a whole lot of auxiliary code just for the purpose of running tests. And speaking of tests, you'll probably notice that the tests here are baked straight into our code example. And you might be thinking, well, tests are usually very complex, are they not? Building you know, a test for software library means you have to do things like unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, regression tests, um, security tests, and, and so on and so forth. So building tests for software library is very complex. But then the thing is, we're not building a software library. We're just building examples of using a particular software library, or in this case, a database. And that means, I think, we only really need one thing, which is functional tests. In other words, does the code base behave as intended given those inputs? And I think what that means is our code, or the test, excuse me, can look something like this. The response, as in this particular case, we're making sure that the query includes uh, a, the key called additional. So we just simply test that condition in our results. In this particular case, we get some results from our database and make sure that the results are within a certain threshold of distance. So again, the test is just one line here. Or in some cases, we actually test our GraphQL queries through the Python client, as well as the native Python client uh, queries itself. And all we need to do to make sure that they work is that they uh, the responses are the same, unless they're broken, I guess, exactly the same way, which is extremely unlikely. And this remains the case regardless of whether you're looking at a Python uh, query like this, whether you're looking at a GraphQL query or TypeScript examples. The tests are these lines that are highlighted in yellow because you can see the assertion statement. They're really fairly minimal and, and fairly straightforward to build and also to maintain, which is really the benefit of this methodology. So I think when we consider how much work really um, adds by, by doing this thing, I think the answer is really not much at all because a lot of our code, like our initialization and instantiation and importing libraries, so this green bit that I've highlighted here, you're writing anyway. And as you saw, these tests, these fairly simple functional tests are short and relatively easy to formulate, right? So in my view, those were not really any, uh, barely any, any additional work at all. And the beauty of it is that the, the, the benefits you get when you have to revisit or maintain the code, I think really outweighs the downsides. So the only thing we haven't shown is this, how do we show the code in the documentation? We said earlier that to the end user, it all looks the same, but we have all this extra code. So how do we just show this particular snippet, this crucial code snippet, to the user without distracting them with all this additional code. Our solution was 
to build this extra component, which is a React component called filter text block. And all this does is to filter each line in our code example based on markers. You can see the markers here above and below our code snippets called basic get by Python and end basic get Python. So these markers are indicated uh, or used in the text block and it pulls in the code in between the two. So more concretely, our code examples look like this. Our source Python file includes all these markers in various places. These are then, uh, some of these markers are then used by individual components to extract sections of code. And the user just sees that particular snippet of code between these markers. There are some additional benefits here as well. So what we can now do is to use the same snippet in multiple examples. So those few lines of code that you see um, up above has multiple markers. Um, and then the set below has the same markers in different places. So from the user's perspective, what they see is a combined uh, set of those lines as though it was just one block of code, even though in the actual um, Python script, they are separated by whatever number of lines, I think 40 or so in that particular example there. And because we're using the same code examples here, the change, any change that we make can be propagated to every example where it's shown. So here we have these same markers that are used to capture this initial initialization section. And if we make a change as we do here, it'll get propagated because the markers that are shown in these uh, sections get propagated to different parts of the documentation. So to the end user, um, you'll, they'll see different examples as though they were separate pieces of code snippets. And this, for us, it reduces repetition and it provides really a lot of flexibility in how we write the code examples without, and, and while all the while reducing the opportunities for errors. So, and running tests has been really quite simple because our code, as we saw, includes the assertion statements and the tests um, themselves execute the code. So the simplicity also means that we can coordinate these tests centrally. Uh, just to run all these tests at the moment, we just run PyTest, like uh, the, the command PyTest, and that's all you need to run. And that'll currently run about 40 sets of tests in between Python, GraphQL, TypeScript, and JavaScript. And all of this in, runs in about just a couple, under a couple of minutes. I think it's even more than that now since, since the conference. So what we've done effectively is to go from this documentation as code approach to what I like to call code as documentation approach. Um, and it's really been a really interesting and exciting kind of experiment and, and um, uh, transition from our perspective. So in summary, we've had um, now we've got it set up, got the system set up so that the examples are real code. It's really increased our confidence in the tested examples. And as you saw, it's really simplified our workflow because we know that these uh, code examples work. To test them is less work than before. And if you're maintaining the code, it's not really that different from maintaining any code uh, as it is because it's all self-contained. And as you saw earlier also, you're reusing these code examples is easier and in a lot of ways more flexible too. Now, there's still a lot to do. Um, for example, we still need to implement code in Java and Go. Uh, we still have to convert a lot of legacy examples to this format. So it means a little bit of, well, fair bit of refactoring. Um, but I think it's also been quite successful. It's showing a lot of benefits for our users because we can say con with confidence to them, oh, this code example works. Or if someone reports a broken example, we can convert that to a testable example and say, oh yeah, sorry, that was broken. Um, so, but we've fixed that now. Um, and, and that's really been beneficial and in terms of giving us more certainty and more flexibility for our, for our users and us. Um, and ha after having spoken to a few people at the conference, um, I think people found this quite interesting, but obviously um, this is a bit of an ongoing experiment or in ongoing process for us as well. Um, so I'm sure it'll, evolve and change over time, which is uh, still very, very exciting. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. And um, I'm on Twitter as well. So if you want to reach out, my Twitter handles uh, underscore JP Huang.
and uh, I'd love to get people's thoughts about about all this and um, look to uh, maybe hopefully report back on it next year or so. Thanks very much.